Um, so when was the house built? In 1938, at the end of the Depression. And, and what was its original vision and purpose? This is a storybook house mm -hmm. that my mother always told me she had picked out of a magazine. Now, at that time, in those days, I thought she meant good housekeeping, and I couldn't figure out how she found a house in Good Housekeeping magazine. Mm -hmm. But what she really meant was a blueprint catalog. Mm -hmm. When my father was going to build the house, I'm sure he must have had a contractor or somebody who brought them the magazines and pictures of, of, of houses and blueprints, and she picked one out. And luckily for them, and certainly for me, it was this house, which was very special and unique, certainly for its time and even yet today. So with this house, um, you mentioned before that you spent some time in this house and then you made some adjustments to it. Well, the house was a wonderful house. Mm -hmm. And when my father built it at the end of the Depression, for a brand new house in a small town and one that is unique in its style mm -hmm. with all the landscaping and uh, the, the, in those days everyone had a, a concrete driveway. Now I can't stand concrete driveways. I want things to be more natural and gravel. Mm -hmm. But it had, he must have spent a fortune doing sidewalks mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything. And of course garages. My father had a two car garage which in the 30s was pretty impressive because most people only had one car if they had any. And I think we were the, really the only people on our street that had a car. Everybody else walked still in those days. So it was very special and very nice. But as the years went by, I always knew, as I learned more about landscape and gardens and the proper colors, the appropriate colors for certain style houses, I learned that things should be changed and altered. And so over these many, many, many years that I've now lived in the house, I've made those changes. And I think they have been for the better. But I had my father's money paid for my education and my experience to learn the things that he didn't know. My dad didn't finish sixth grade. And that was not unusual for men born way back in the 19th century in the time of Queen Victoria. He was working by the time he was in seventh grade. So I had the advantage of that, that he never had himself. So the, can you talk a little bit about um, the style of the house, just for those who are not as familiar with the, with the different types of architecture and the styles? This is a storybook house. Mm -hmm. It's a very quaint house because it has a round turret front entrance. And anybody who was a kid in my time, if they were asked to draw a picture of a castle, they would draw a turret with a witch's roof, just like we have on this house. It, it, it's called a storybook house. Now, they've been building charming buildings similar to this for centuries around the world, and some much more charming and certainly much larger. But the history of the storybook house in America goes back to a silent movie studio in Culver City, California, and they built a house or a building of storybook fantasy nature for a movie set, although we've never found the movie in which it appeared, but that movie could have disappeared. But it was also a permanent to be used as office space and dressing rooms. And when the studio uh, closed, it was purchased and moved to Beverly Hills, where it is still to this day a private home. And if you want to look it up, all you have to do is type in the Witch House, Los Angeles, and it will come up. It's a it's a landmark in Los Angeles. So, um, I'd love to learn a little bit about your your journey and um, sort of how you got into. I know you're a TV you were a TV personality and a radio personality. Um, what made you want to to do that? What inspired you to take that route? I was. Uh, it, I'm sure that people who grow up seeing films and television or music, they're inspired. If they have any interest in those areas, it just encourages them to perhaps follow through, to be a singer or, uh, or an actor or whatever it might be. I was just, I grew up with radio 
And I think some of the most, you know, I've interviewed, as you know, thousands of people, many, 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 many movie stars. And But when I met some of my radio heroes, people who I had listened to on the radio, like The Shadow, or those, that was just thrilling. Because we would sit in this house in the dark listening to the radio, to these radio shows. When I got to high school, uh, the, the, the radio station in my hometown of Streeter had just been put on the air. It didn't have a station up until many state, many little towns didn't have stations in those days, but we got a new one. And I was very lucky that someone else in my high school, I think he might have been a sophomore or so, he was interested in radio and television. And he got the local radio station to allow the high school in Streeter to have an hour's time every Saturday for the high school kids to put on their own show. And they would say they would divide the hour into various types of little 10 minute shows. And we all got a got one. And, and I got one. And that was my beginning. And then after a, a short time of doing that, uh, I got an actual job at the radio station doing various things. So I started very young. But for the city of Streeter, in those days, that little high school adventure, the, the man who was the vice president of ABC News is from Streeter. The man who uh, was the chief projectionist at Radio City Music Hall from Streeter. Many people from this community went on to great careers in radio and television, and it all started with that high school group. So that's why it's always imperative that people who have any conversation encourage people, young people to do things, because you never know what's going to trigger a long career. And for you, so once you, once you kind of knew that you wanted to do radio, what was it like? What were some of your favorite parts and favorite memories during that time that you that you enjoyed? Well, I I liked being on the radio. I, I I don't know how you describe how you like things. I mean, I I how how I mean, I've heard other people, and I probably have had this asked this question, and I don't know if anybody has a good answer. How there's just something about. The, the response to doing those things that you get enjoyment from. It wasn't that you were on the radio, but you, you, uh, I think you felt you were contributing something. And I did get involved in a lot of very unusual situations in Streeter and in Chicago. Do you have time for one story yeah, about I'd love to hear. The, 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 uh, when I, I went to college in Chicago? I went to Columbia College. In those days, it was down in the loop. I think there were only 20 students. This was not a major important school in my time. Uh, but I was working in, I was doing a radio show in Chicago, which I taped, and I was then coming back to Streeter on weekends and that sort of thing and working back here at my local radio station. But during that time, the mayor of Streeter and the entire city council were arrested by the FBI for kickbacks of a new sewer plant, develop, uh, plant that was being built in Streeter. I was doing my radio show at the, at the um, Little Egypt Lounge of the Water Tower Inn, which sat right next to the Water Tower in downtown Chicago. And the mayor of Streeter, of all places on earth, was arrested in that room by the FBI where I was doing my radio show. And then at some point I had done an interview locally with that mayor. And at one point the F I was working on the air. I was on the air and the manager of the station came in and said to me, the FBI is out here and they want to talk to you. Well, of course my heart stopped. I thought, what have I, what have I done? Well, they, were, they had come to, to take that tape back to use in federal court as evidence against the mayor because he admitted his guilt. But it never had to be used, and I was never called because there was enough evidence without it. I was involved in another case in Streeter where I was called to testify because of things that we were doing on the radio and talking about this case. So that's been my whole career. You never know what you're going to be involved in, 
but you also feel you're contributing something, you're doing something. It's, I suppose the most frustrating thing for most people is, well, you have the, all this electronic internet stuff now where you can express your opinions, but most people couldn't really express their opinions, and yet I had a whole audience to you know, talk to every day.